What's going on YouTube? This is Ips. I'm doing CrossFit 2 from Hack the Box, which was an insane box that I loved because almost every single step of this box, I learned something new. It starts out with a simple SQL injection in the website, which I've done a hundred times, probably even in these videos. However, it does it over WebSockets, and I never really played that much with WebSockets. Once you do the SQL injection, you have to use cross-site scripting to force a user to create an account for you. And in order to do that, you have to bypass Core's header, which I hadn't done before. And with that new account, you have access to a new chat room. And then you can analyze the code in the chat room to discover you can use cross-site scripting yet again to snoop in on someone's direct messages and you get a password to the web server. With that password, you can log in and discover there's a simple privesk by injecting a node modules directory up a few parent directories. And once you do that, you can get root's SSH key through a binary exploitation and you try to use it and you can't because SSH is locked down with YubiKey. So you have to steal a bunch of YubiKey secrets from the box and then build your own two factor. So with all that being said, let's jump in. As always, I'm going to start off with an end map. So dash SC for default scripts, SV enumerate versions, OA output all formats, put in the end map directory and call it CrossFit2. And then the IP address of 10.10.10.232. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we can see just two ports are open. And I know that quickly because number one, I've done this box before, but number two, it's saying it's not showing the 998 closed ports, and by default, Nmap just checks the top 100. So we have SSH on 22, its banner tells us it's open SSH 8.4. And it isn't giving us any extra information. So normally I'm used to seeing it tell me like the distro like Ubuntu or things like that. The next port we have is HTTP on port 80. And its banner tells us it's PHP 7.4.12, which means it's probably running a PHP web server. If you didn't know, you can just do like, P well, before I do that, I'm going to make the directory dub dub dub. So I don't like host any of my content in this one directory. It's always good to know where your web server directories are. And then dash capital S, the IP address you want to listen on. I want to listen on everything. And then like 80, uh, permission denied. So let's run that with sudo. And we have our PHP development server running. Um, mine is 7.4.15. This is 7.4.12. I'm guessing the PHP is relatively up to date. So looking at the results, we have it just getting a page, um, content, yoga, studio, CrossFit. Nothing too interesting here. Going down again, X powered by PHP. The server header is telling us it's OpenBSD. So we got the distro of Unix, I guess I should say, because it's OpenBSD, it's not Linux. And the main thing with this is the paths when I do like LFIs are gonna be drastically different. Also, I don't think like that normal bash one line or reverse shell works. So things like that, I just have to take an account for. The two servers I hate coming across that are Nix based is OpenBSD or Solaris because it just messes up all my commands. So we'll probably come into some frustration a little bit later. This is just some fingerprinting information and nothing else. So let's go take a look at the page. Going to 10.10.10.232, we get this CrossFit page. And one thing I always like doing is opening things with um, the web console up or web developer mode. I don't know what this is. But looking at this, we can see it's got content security policy. Uh, we have Firefox can establish a connection to websockets gym.crossfit.htb. So we do have the host name. And I don't know if that was actually in the Nmap result. So I'm going to do grep capital R and we'll say CrossFit and then in the Nmap directory. And the only way that we know it's CrossFit is because of our host name. So in HTTP or SSH, it did not leak the host name, but we have it now. So let's add it into our host file. So we can do 10.10.10.232 CrossFit.htb and gym.crossfit.htb. And then let's go take a look at this page. We can click on about us. It is definitely PHP. So we should be doing um, a Durbust on PHP scripts. Going around, we have a blog. The one thing I like about blogs is seeing if they have a way to view individual pages, like single.php or something, because that's like custom blogs and CTFs. That's where you'd normally find SQL injections. But this looks like it's a static page. I don't see any way I can give it input. So I'm just gonna move on. We have a contact.php and we can put a message here. So I'm gonna try ipsec root at ipsec.rocks. And then I'm just gonna do test and let's do image source is equal to 
HTTP 10, 10, 14, 8 slash image. I think I did that correctly. I always question my HTML abilities, which is kind of funny. So let's go into www v index.html. Do this and we'll say, give this a name, uh, test.image and python 3-m HTTP server. And if I go to localhost 8000, it tries to load that image. Awesome. The only thing we have to do is make sure we're listening on port 80. Uh, permission denied, let's run that with sudo. And now I can send this here. And all this is telling me is if someone um, views this. So I sent this and did something? I guess that may be a post message. Um, the other thing I can do is we can do this again. Test, test. Send it through burp suite. Make sure my intercept is on. It is. Send. And it doesn't look like it does anything. So I don't know if this contact form is sending any data. Or I'm pretty sure it's not. So let's move on to the next thing. We go and we get employees.crossfit.htb. So we got a, another domain we need to add. So let's go back over here and put it in. So before we go poking at these domains, we always want to have some type of recon going on in the background. So I'm going to do two things. Let's do sudo nmap p 10 10 10 232. And we can say OA nmap crossfit dash all ports. Always good to have a full nmap scan going. And we can add the dash V flag so it shows us open ports as it finds them. And then, of course, we want to do a go buster. So go buster dir dash u http 10 10 10 232 word list opt sec list um, discovery web content raft small words dot php uh, no <laughs> dot txt uh, dash x for arguments php and dash o for out file and we'll call this go buster root dot log. There we go. So now we have go buster running. We have an nmap going. We can take a look at the other subdomains. So the first one was gym.crossfit.htb. This is just going back to this page. If we do, um, actually one thing we have here is this little chat window. And this is probably that WebSocket request that was failing. It was probably using that. Um, normally these things use WebSockets. Uh, what was the other one we had? Cat Etsy host. Uh, employees.crossfit.htb we want to look at. Uh, what? HTTP. There we go. And we have a sign-in form, so we can try like admin admin. We may want to run SQL map to see if this is SQL injectable. We can just try um, A or 1 equals 1. Just a basic like SQL payload. Don't see anything. If we go to forgot password, admin at crossfit.htb and we have unknown email address. So right off the bat, we know this reset password, we can enumerate potential emails. So if I was doing an actual engagement and knew the like subdomain, I would probably be using wfuzz. Actually, let's just try this. Uh, I have not tried this before, so who knows what we'll get. Test at test.com. Uh, I needed to send this to burp suite. Okay, it's just a post request with um, email equals. So we can go back here where my recon tab is. We can do fuff dash w for word list opt sec list. Uh, let's go cd opt sec list find dot grep name. Let's see, usernames. So let's do usernames names dot text. What's this look like? Cat. A lot of names. Let's see, grep dash i username ms top usernames. Let's try look at this. Eh. This is gonna be getting rid of dupes. I don't like all those special characters and usernames. I'm just trying to find email. 
So I'm going to go with that very first word list we used. Um, common, family names, USA, top 1,000. Is this last name? That is last name. Let's see. Let's just do names.txt. Okay. So we can do fuff, wf, uh, op, sec list, usernames, names.txt, dash u, http, and this is employees.crossfit.htb, password reset. Get rid of this double http. And then we can say uh, dash d, and it's going to be email equals. Yep. Email is equal to fuzz at crossfit.htb. And then all we want to do is hide the results of 213. So dash filter words, 213, and this may give us a potential email address. Um, maybe or maybe not. So when we get usernames, we'll have to come back to this to see if we did it correctly. So I would go back and look at that WebSocket thing. So now when we go to crossfit.htb, the uh, WebSocket resolves. When we first enumerated the page, it couldn't access the WebSocket on gym.crossfit.htb. Therefore, this thing didn't show up. But now it does. We can poke at it. Uh, can I make this bigger? Sweet. So we can say help to see commands, available commands, coaches, classes, and memberships. And we can click here for a simple thing. And if we want to intercept these web sockets, we can just send this over to Burp Suite. Look at like memberships. Oh God, it just disappeared. Um, let's turn Burp off. CrossFit.htb. Okay, turn Burp on and say memberships. And we're sending this, and we're sending this token. This is like a cross-site request forgery token. Actually, we can send it in repeater. And it gives us, let's see. We sent, and we didn't get anything back. To server. Respond to me, server. Huh. Let's go. Let's try this again. Turn proxy off. Go back to crossfit.htb. WebSockets are always buggy when you do something. And it may be the case that I didn't say something in the chat, and the first time you send a message, you like activate a login thing. So something like that is totally possible what happened. So I'm going to send memberships again. We got it. Go to repeater. And the server. I don't think it's responding to me. We got direction to server and the server never goes back to us. Reconnect. Send. Okay. Um, incorrect token. So now let's put this token in. Paste. Send. And we have this here. So what I want to do is refresh and let's play with that button. So I'm just going to say membership. Uh, memberships and then we can intercept this one request if I click here and this one was interesting to me because it was giving a parameter we got message available params is equal to one and I'm waiting for like it to disconnect maybe I double click this and reconnect incorrect a missing token put this here send there we go so we have a message, good news, the membership plan is available, and it gives us some debug output. So I'm going to, again, copy this token, and eventually we'll script this out in Python, but I want to play with SQL injection. So the first thing I'm going to do is put something, a single quote here, and it can't really understand me. So what I'm going to do next is put a comment after that, because we broke the SQL statement, and it's still not working. We can try it with a double quote. I'm just waiting for it to say something positive. And it's not responding to me. What if my VPN's going down or something? What if it's like all my 
fuzzing. Let's see. I definitely want the port scan. There. Let's reconnect. We have a hello send. So whenever I do, oh, I know what it is. Uh, the double quotes a bad character because we're sending JSON. So we just sent a invalid thing because, um, yeah, that double quote. So try backspace and it can't understand me. So I was just escaping this one quote. So the other thing we can do is just try it with no quotes and still can't understand me. So let's do the same thing we did, but with the uh, params. So send this, we do a single quote. Uh, membership plan is unavailable. So what I'm gonna do is say param is equal to does not exist. And we get unavailable. So all we wanna do is make sure we didn't cause a um, SQL error and saw that message. So that's why I did something that didn't involve a SQL injection. So we now know this is just an error the application gives and not necessarily because it's SQL injectable. So param is one and then we can do, uh, we already did this, I think. Let's try it with an escaped double quote unavailable, and then we can try it with nothing. And it looks like that worked. Um, we did this parameter and we put a comment and it did not error out. So all I wanna do is make sure it's not doing something funky. So I'll do like one B to make sure it's not just picking the integer. And we get incorrect token. And out of curiosity, I'm gonna try like zero oh, uh, 01. And we know it's treating this as an integer, not a string. And we can try 0x1. And I don't know what this really tells me other than I just like fingerprinting applications to see how it works. So we can do hex as well. But we know we had a valid SQL injection here without a comment. So I'm gonna do one union select one, membership unavailable. It's returning two things, so I'm guessing we just needed two parameters here. One comma two, and we get good news. The membership plan is available. So what we wanna do is try to get data in here. So I'm gonna do please and then subscribe. And it's still saying ID one one, so all I'm gonna do is increment this a few times to see if we ever get something different. And at three, we have it saying please and subscribe. So let's see what just happens if we just did the parameter three. So if we do union select, get rid of this union and just send three, it just says the membership plan's unavailable. But our union is making this return something else and that's why we're getting it. So if we just did one, two, it'll say um, the membership plan is available. There we go, ID one, name two. So now we have confirmed we have SQL injection in a WebSocket. The tough part is now weaponizing this because we have to use Python to create a WebSocket or we can live in this burp suite window but copying this token constantly is just a pain. So let's switch over to Python to automate this for us. And that Nmap scan is still going. Um, I just want to look at the go buster root to see if we have anything before we do that. Grep dash V 403. And the pages look about average. So let's do V. Oh, I'm not in my home directory. Let's just exit. Go back here. Crossfit two. V inject.py. So there are two ways we can really go about this. The first way would probably be going the middleware route and writing something to expose these web sockets over HTTP. So we can just point SQL map at our web server and give it a parameter and that parameter goes and forwards it to the web socket for us and just run SQL map to get it. I'm not going to be showing that because um, I think it just makes it 
like a bit too easy in the terms of uh, learning SQL injection. If you want to understand it, you can probably either go to OXDF's write-up, where I know he does both because we worked on that piece together, or go to ipsec.rocks and watch a video of me do it with um, who is. So the other way is to use Python and just create a simple way to do a bunch of SQL commands. So we're going to do that. The first thing we need to do is import WebSocket. And then how we interact with this, we're going to create like a simple command line. So from CMD, import CMD. And then there's a lot of JSON involved. So I'm just going to import JSON. So the first thing we have to do is create our basic um, CMD application. So we'll do CMD and then prompt is equal to injection. And then we just do a define default self args and then print args. And all I'm doing here is just building a skeleton to make sure I got this piece correct. So term is equal to tom, term, and then term.cmd loop. So if I now execute inject.py, we just have this simple command line application. Um, I wonder if I do def exit and return true. Does that do anything? Def exit, self args, return true. Does this give me exit? No. I know there's some way I can, or maybe do exit, my bad. Do exit. Yeah. So that's how we can exit this application gracefully. But next step is to actually connect via WebSockets. So we want to do some initialization because we have to um, have the socket connect. And then we also have to um, get the very first token, which is a CSERF. So def init self, and then we'll call self.connect. And later on, we'll build this out. And then super init. And the reason why we do this is because we're overriding this initialization. And if we didn't do this, then the um, CMD library wouldn't go over its normal initialization and may miss things. So all this does is lets us start off something and then tell it to go through your normal initialization. And now we have to create the connect. So def connect self. And I'm going to say it's called by init. There we go. And then self.websocket is equal to websocket.create connection. And this was jim.crossfit.htb slash websocket, probably. I can go over to Burp Suite to confirm this. Uh, let's see. I think I can. Is there any request to Jim? Jim. At the beginning of the video, I'm pretty sure I saw that 404 of it failing. So we can try that. Um, then we can say data is equal to json.loads and then self.websocket.receive because we got data. And if I just print this data out, it's going to print um, probably a JSON string. So let's just do this. Python 3. Yeah. So we have this. The main thing we want to grab is token. So all I'm going to do is say um, self.token is equal to data token. Now I'm not returning a variable here because the main thing I want to do is always update the self.token with whenever we call a WebSocket. So this variable just stays up to date. So the next piece we want to do is now send a WebSocket message. So we'll do another definition, send WebSocket self params. And then I'm going to create a dictionary because dictionaries convert to JSON very easily. And then message, message is equal to, and whenever we go to our WebSockets, we send message available params three and then token. So we'll do message, available, then message params is equal to params, and message token is equal to self.token. Now we need to send a message, so self.ws.send, and we're just going to send json.dumps 
message. And all this does is convert this dictionary into a JSON. Um, if we want, we can print json.dumps message and put this in parentheses. Then the next thing we want to do is a um, data is equal to self.ws.receive and then probably convert this over to JSON. And then we can do self.token is equal to data token. So we update, we sent a command, so we have to update what our token is for the next command. And then we can also return data debug. So now in our default, all we have to do is say print, then self.send websocket args. And let's see what happens. So I send it one. Uh, JSON has no attribute JSON. Do I have like JSON.json? .json? Yeah. JSON.loads data. One. And we're turning data now, right? So here's what I can do union select one, comma, two. And let's see. Union select I ip sec. So we have confirmed we have injection here. So the thing we want to do is not have to always put three space and then this union. Um, we just want to hard code that and then let us run nested SQL commands, right? Um, that may not make 100% sense. And you can see, hold on, this print is that json.dumps on data. So let's get rid of this or on message. So on this params, this is what we modify. So we say um, three union select params comma two. And we have to now put this as a F string. And then we can try this out by saying select A. And looks like we have some type of error. Let's put this in parentheses. There we go. So when you're doing nested SQL injection within a union statement, the SQL command you want should be enclosed in parentheses like this. So what this is doing is whenever we type something, it's gonna do the union injection for us. And then it's going to run a SQL command right here and do the comma two so that one piece is always two, which is name. And if you heard like some weird sound in the background, I think my dog started snoring and scared me for a second as I was talking. <laughs> so let's just um, move on and do some SQL injections. Running our script, uh, specify Python 3. We can try to enumerate the information schema table. So select group underscore concat schema name from information schema dot schemata and fix this typo. And we can get the databases. So information schema, CrossFit, and employees. Uh, if we really wanted to, we could clean this input up by hiding data. So what I'm going to do is that real quick since we mentioned it. Um, I do echo n, uh, yeah, echo dash n, so we don't do a line break. And this is 10 characters at the end. And what is this, five characters? Echo dash n, wc dash c, five. So we just go into it and inject script. And then on this, return, let's see, I wonder if I can do it here. So we can say um, five colon minus 10. So this is saying, take the string, go up five characters, and then go back 10 characters. So now when I try this, let's do this select. We only get what we want. So there are three uh, databases. And if this part confuses you, all I'm doing is enumerating information underscore schema. Information underscore schema, my SQL. 
and we go to this database and we go to the tables reference. Is this it? No, that's not it. Um, general tables. Here we go. And I pulled the schemata table, I think. Yep, right here. And this tells me everything here. I did the name of the schema, which is the database. So the next one I'm going to do is go into the tables. The tables table, I guess. It's a funny one. Yeah, information schema, tables table. And I'm going to select the table name where the table schema is something I want. So let's do this. Uh, let's do group concat. And the group concat is what's allowing me to select multiple things. If I just did select schema name, it would go in multiple rows and probably error out because this isn't designed to return multiple rows. The group concat takes those multiple rows, puts them into one row, which makes it happy. So group concat table name from information schema dot tables and looks like our WebSocket timed out. We could go and have it like reconnect on error, but we could also uh, just be a bit quicker. Okay, so we have this and we can say where the table catalog, which I think is the um, database does not equal, um, actually we can just say table catalog is equal to, was it CrossFit? I think it was a CrossFit and employees. Maybe it's table underscore schema. There we go. So we had two databases. Um, I should have logged this, but CrossFit and employees. So CrossFit has membership plans and employees has two. It has an employees table and uh, password reset. So if you want to view the column names out of here, you guessed it, we just do column name from information schema where table schema is equal to this uh, dot columns. And I don't like how this is viewed. Um, because it's not telling us the table. It's not a huge issue because there's only one table here. But whenever I do this, I generally have this group concat do table underscore name and then column name. So I know this is, oh, this was showing two different um, tables. But we have employees, like this is the table name, column name, table name, column name. And then if you will make it a little bit prettier, you can add a line break on the end. So we have employees ID, username, email, password reset, email token expires. So we have that and we can also do the CrossFit table. And the CrossFit table has membership plans, ID, name, base price, whatever. So this isn't too interesting. We probably want to put all our effort into dumping this. So we can do group concat and say, uh, let's do username, then password and email, password, email from CrossFit.employees. Actually, it was employees, right? Table schema is CrossFit.employees, like that, yeah. Of course, we aired out. Let's copy this command. And we aired. I want to say the database was employees. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The database is employees dot employees. And we have everything. So administrator. And that email is David Palmer. Then we got W. Smith, Will Smith at CrossFit, um, Maria Williams, Jay Parker. I'm going to focus all my effort really on David Palmer because he is the administrator. We could try cracking this hash, but it doesn't really lead us anywhere. So I'm not going to do it because it would just be a time sink. But what I would do is WC-C, see it's 64 characters. And I know that's a SHA-256 sum, I believe, or it's likely to be SHA-256 sum. So I'm just echoing junk that doesn't matter to get this hash. And we can do echo-n WC-C. 
So 64. So let's try a password reset. So now that we have a valid thing, and we know our usernames wouldn't work because we only did first name at crossfit.htb and we didn't have anything here. So I wanted to see if our wfuzz would have worked if we did it correctly. So I'm gonna do dash word list and we'll just do test.txt and edit test.txt to be David Palmer. And next one will be ipsec. So if this only gives us David Palmer, we did it correct. If it gives us nothing, then this piece would not work. And we did that one plan incorrectly. I wonder if this needs to be URL encoded. Uh, let's see. Decoder at encode HTML. No, it's probably 40 still. Encode URL, yeah, percent 40 like this, huh. So Ipsec and David Palmer is getting the same result. So we probably want to check this out manually. So let's go to password reset, turn it on, and we'll try David Palmer at crossfit.htb. Let's see, proxy, it's probably gonna do like a 302 to redirect or something and wfuzz followed it or something. Wait, unknown email, okay. So go to repeater here, 200 okay. So it says recent link sent, please check email. But in our repeater window, we do have that. This doesn't exist. Oh, shoot. This thing always gets me with fuff. And one of the reasons why I often use um, wfuzz. Have to set the content type most likely. There we go. And we can do filter words for 226, which is um, does not exist. And only David Palmer comes back. So again, if we do test.txt, ipsec, please subscribe, does not exist, take out the filter. You can see emails that don't exist are gonna be 226 words, which is invalid email, and then reset link sent is 230. So that's how you do it, fuff, um, 213. Always, uh, It was working, there we go. Um, always, always, always remember to use this header whenever you use fuff. Maybe the latest version has that set by default if it's not, but let's move on. So we have the reset link sent, which means we should be able to go back and dump the resets. So if we go up, the table name is password reset, and we want to get these. So VT. So select group concat. Uh, we want email token expires and put like something between these from password Reset, wait, what was the database? I really should have been taking notes for this video and Obsidian. Let's see. So this is the employees table or employees database password reset table. So from employees.passwordreset and my WebSockets probably timed out. So let's just restart, run it, and we don't have anything. But my doorbell came off, so I'm gonna be right back. Okay, I'm back, sorry about that. I'm getting interrupted a lot more than normal. 
But we saw this query and it returned null, which means the SQL injection worked. If we do something that doesn't exist, so like employees that does not exist, this is gonna return, well, <laughs> it's gonna error out because we're too lazy to code the reconnect thing if the WebSockets down. But if we do this, it returns a bunch of the SQL syntax. So we know the password reset thing does exist, but maybe we just took too long and it cleared the reset link. So I'm gonna run this again, and then we're going to do this, and we can get a valid thing. Now, the issue we're gonna run into is we don't know the actual syntax, how this works. Because even though we have this token, just because we have the token, where do we input it? Um, best get is we could try to fuzz this. So we can say, um, go back to a fuff. And let's do password reset. And then let's see. It's going to retype the command. So fuff dash w for word list, opt sec list, and then is there fuzzing? And then there should be a parameters. Let's see. cd opt sec list fuzzing find dot grep param grep dash i. Is it a word list? There we go. This is what I want. Discovery web content. So even though we're technically fuzzing. We just want to get BERT parameter names. So opsec list discovery, BERT parameter names, and then dash u, and we go here, paste this in, and we just want the parameter to be fuzz is equal to one. And all this is gonna do is um, fuzz a bunch of potential parameters for this password reset.php. And then we can do um, dash filter size, I guess. Let's do that one, 4228. And right off the bat, we do get a token. So we have a potential way to reset this. So let's go here, password reset.php, change this over to a git request. And I did git for password resetting because it's almost always going to be a git because if you can't really put a post parameter in a link and most of these password resets email you a link. So they put the token, whatever, in the actual header. So the next step to do is um, get this. So it's going to air out. We really should fix the script, but I think this is the last time we need it for a bit. Uh, let's go back here. What was it? David Palmer at CrossFit.htb. In Burp Suite, we should for this. And then we get this token, and we can just paste this in. Actually, we don't even need Burp Suite. We can turn this off, and then say password reset token is equal to this. and we get invalid token. That's weird. Select group, token still exists, but yeah, so we can't really do anything with this. So we can move on with our SQL injection. I'm not done with it yet. And think of other things we can do. One of the common ones is um, enumerating files on the system. So we can run a command to check if we can do that by doing a select group underscore concat grantee privilege type. And we probably should put a colon there. From information schema dot user privileges. And we can see the CrossFit user has the file permission, which means we can read files. So we can do select load underscore file Etsy past WD. And we could read that. So the next thing to do is probably enumerate the Apache configuration because there were a lot of like virtual hosts. So did we miss anything? I don't know. 
So we can look at Etsy HTTP.com. And if this was a Ubuntu box, it would be like Etsy Apache 2, then Apache 2.conf, I think, or H Etsy Apache 2 HTTP.conf. Forget the exact path, but again, remember this is BSD, so that's why the paths are going to be slightly different. So we got server 000. It's listening on port 8000, uh, index.php. So this is probably the main web server because it's just doing a PHP FPM. So this is PHP web server. Then we got server employees on port 8001 and its root is htdocs underscore employees. It's another PHP app running PHP FPM. So who knows where these are? We also have this chat on 8002 and we got a few rewrites here, but this is I think the WebSocket. I um, don't see anything that can confirm that right off the bat, but the main issue I'm seeing here is we have all these ports, but nothing listening on port 80. So there's some type of application in front of this, and on BSD land, that's probably gonna be RelayD. So we can try reading this file, RelayD.conf, and uh, I've had enough of this error. Let's see if we can fix this real quick. Uh, v inject.py. So let's see. Connect. Let's try. Try this. And then if it fails, let's call connect. Self.connect. And send it again. Maybe that works, or maybe we just broke the application more. So I'm just going to um, run the script, and I'm going to take a like 15 to 30 second break, and we'll see if um, it errors out when I come back. Okay, let's just try it again. If we just do ABC, it should do something, but we got the WebSocket close message. So it doesn't look like that works. Um, Looking at this, I think it should have hit this. Let's see. Am I sending anywhere else? Send WS. Default. I mean, we can try putting it here as well. Try then. Accept. And we can just, whoops. Yank this. Yank this connect. Maybe try it that way. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is let's create a read function, since we have to read files often. Args, and then we can say um, param is equal to, or we can call it payload, it's equal to select load file args. We put this in quotes. And then we need that to be an F string. And then yank all this. It's ugly as crap, but if it works, it works. Um, I thought I yanked it. For yank yank. Put. Three yank yank. There we go. So instead of sending args, we send payload. Okay. Let's try this real quick. Python 3 inject read etsy passwd. Awesome. So read etsy relay d or is it relay relay.conf? Relay d relay a comp. Uh, relayd.conf. There we go. Found it. So this is how um, the web server is forwarding things. It's a bit confusing of a file, but we can see it's checking the header. If the header exists, crossfit-club.htb, then it forwards it to three. If it's employees, it forwards it to two. So we can kind of see how this works. Let's see. Uh, let's just highlight everything on two. And if it's web, 2 is going to port 8001. 
uh, three is going to 9999. So we can see that forwarding message. Here it's checking the actual paths. So one of these is probably searching for WebSocket. Yeah, match request WebSocket, send it to four. So this is sending it to the chat, which will be, uh, where's chat? Four, uh, four, four, one, nine. So that's how that works. Hopefully that makes sense. But this is a new domain, crossfit-club.htb. So let's check this out. Pseudo vi etsy host. And we can say crossfitclub.htb. Go to a browser, http crossfit-club.htb. And we got portal front end. And we have a whole new website. So username, password, again, we can try admin password or admin admin. Probably try SQL map here for a good measure, but nothing's here. We can try to sign up, but the sign up button is blanked out. If we do username ipsec root at ipsec.rocks, password, password, uh, still can't log in. We could try like editing this. So going up into a fancy web console, we can try making this button enabled. So let's see, div, so we can just delete the disabled. So button disabled, delete that. And then we can check this disabled equals disabled out and see what happens. So now we should be able to click it. I should always send this to Burp Suite so we can see if anything happens, nothing is happening. And if we, look more at this uh, it's doing event something happened there and it's going to this javascript and this just did a 404 not found but looking at the headers of this application we see i thought i was going to say express let's go back to just slash does anything happen here Refresh. I forget how I enumerated this was the Express Web Framework. It's probably a way. There's a lot of JavaScript though, you can see. We got all these JS chunks. Portal front end does not work properly without JavaScript enabled. I wonder if I just go to this front end and view source, what happens? So this web page is much different than before. Um, let's see, let's do an end map again, maybe. So I can just close this pane out, start a new one. And we can do that end map. So sudo end map dash S C S V O A end map. We'll do CrossFit dash strict. Dash P 80, 10, 10, 10, 232. And all I want to do is pretty much run the nmap script scan against this now where I have the this virtual host. Not sure if it'll do anything, but should be interesting. Um, if we go to the JavaScript, that's CSS, CSS. We can try to parse out things. So let's do curl against this. And that is a lot. Let's see. Let's just try analyzing this login. So go to Burp Suite. What does a login request look like? It's posting to API slash login. And we got this weird E tag. I think that's something related to caching. But we have success, false, and there we go. That's why I saw the Express framework. Um, it's in the X powered by when you post to the API. So the main thing is trying to enumerate this API. If we just do a post here, it says cannot post to slash API. We can try like an options request 
to say what options are available. Uh, get head, patch, post, delete. So there's not too much we can do. If we try to get, it just says cannot get slash API. So we want to enumerate potential routes. And we can do that two ways. First, we can fuzz it. So we can do, uh, let's uh, go buster dir dash u http crossfit club dot htb dash w for word list op sec list. Oh, we want slash api slash and then op sec list discovery web content and then probably the BERT parameter names dot text to see if we get anything. So slash auth exists. So it is working. If we do a git on API slash auth, it just says success false, but gives us this token. And seeing anything else, we have a slash ping. So API ping. I don't know what it's saying is offline, but that's all we get. And yeah, we can also do raft small words to see if there's anything else. So we have some type of recon going on in the background, but also uh, we could potentially grab the JavaScript files and enumerate them. So I'm going to control U dot JS, that's CDN dot JS. So we want this JS chunks vendor. So if we grab this, we can curl, and then we want to do a special grep to only show us the content that we want. Uh, maybe that's grep-op, and I'm going to try slash API slash, what is it, this, and maybe a double quote to end it. Is this going to show us what we want? Does not look like it. Let's see, how do we do this? It's been a while since I've used grep this way, but I know I'm doing it somewhat correctly. Um, the easiest way to do is just create a test file and then put a bunch of junk in it and then see what happens. So I'm gonna do the same exact grep, except we're going to do it against that file because maybe that one JavaScript file I have just doesn't have any API endpoints in it. So doing this, let's try reversing with a double quote. Cat test. That should have got, oh, we don't have a slash after API. If we do this, okay, and we can match everything. Let's see, API junk, there we go. So now we're matching the endpoint. So we can try this again against our URL, but what I'm ha guessing happened is we just didn't get the right URL. So where is our big old grep? Let's put it here and nothing. So maybe we can go back to this crossfit.htb page and then use what we learned to extract all the JavaScript pieces. We probably could just go to Burp Suite and get them that way, but this is arguably more fun. So HTTP crossfit club dot, did I just, no. Vtest, paste this junk in and we want to get slash js slash stuff. So cat test grep dash op slash js dot star dot js maybe? Nope. Let's do the same thing we did. Okay, we have a load of JavaScript now. Awesome. For i in, 
do this. Do curl dash s http crossfit club dot htb slash i, I think. And then grep for api slash that. Done. Let's see what happens here if we get anything. Um, we may not because we may have some formatting wrong. Uh, we may just also want to echo i. That's not what we want. Oh, we have to shoot uh, js. We need a Piper thing here. So cat test like that. So now we're going through all the JavaScripts, but still don't have anything. If we just do this curl command, are we just going to get a bunch of things? So a bunch of cannot get. I wonder if we get rid of that slash. There we go. So we couldn't do the double slash like that. So we have a few endpoints now. Auth and login and gritty. Uh, that, don't know what that is, but doesn't look like we're getting that many endpoints. Again, oh, I guess we could have just grabbed this whole thing. This is probably all the chunks. Um, but maybe you learned something doing it the other way of grabbing all those JS files. But Auth and login. There's not too much we can really do with that. So let's go to some of the recon we had going on in the background, which was a go buster, and still doesn't really have anything. We did small words and parameter names, but this is only doing a git request. Um, there are other methods accepted, like the post. So we can do dash m post to also send post requests to see if it's any different. Right off the bat, we did get a slash login, which this should have like triggered me earlier because we knew login existed, but we we're only getting auth and ping. Was login just not in BERT parameter names? I'd highly, highly doubt that. So it's also case insensitive, it looks like. So we could also do um, the small words list in raft, but we do now also have a slash sign up. So we can try to manually craft something with that. So let's go change this to a um, post request and then sign up and we can send the request. Um, it tells us only administrators can register account. So we didn't even have to do too much to try this. Uh, what I was going to do is just validate that exist and then go to like the front end and look at all these variables. So we can see this is input username, email, password and confirm. And then I was going to do this, like username is ipsec. Uh, we have to put it in quotes. I wonder if it would be, it's probably like that. And then password, please subscribe. Confirm, please subscribe. And then the final one was email root at ipsec.rocks, but we didn't even have to do anything. And it's also important to note that I already have a CSRF token in because I had intercepted it. If I did not do that, we get invalid CSRF token. So the way it's doing CSRF tokens is weird because it's working multiple times on different endpoints, but it's there, and I just happened to get lucky when I was intercepting a request or modified it correctly because I don't know exactly how this ended up here, but we have it, and it says only administrators can register accounts. So what I'm getting at now is we probably have to... Um, another thing is this wouldn't work <laughs> because we don't have JSON here. I think application slash JSON is the default type. Uh, oh, we got an error message. So now we're processing JSON. We probably just have to put username and all this stuff in quotes. 
and then it will probably be happy. But yeah, whenever changing from like um, URL encoder to JSON, make sure you do the header. Yeah, so now that the JSON's correct, we're still getting the error message. But we have to do probably some type of cross-site scripting if we want to register accounts. The downside is we don't know how to get anyone's web browser. Like there's no places to input links or things like that. So this is one of the really tough parts of the box is to discover um, there is a extra port listening if we did that full port scan. So if we do CrossFit all ports dot nmap, there is 8953, which is unbound DNS control. So we can install unbound. I think I just did sudo apt install unbound. And this is just like a DNS manager. So we want to go back to our script, python3 inject.py, and steal unbounds configurations because normally DNS servers have some type of secrets they exchange to each other when they try to update each other's zones, the zone being just like a directory of DNS entries. So we want to try to grab that. So I'm going to do read etsy unbound.conf. Doesn't exist. If you do a lot of Googling, you'd find that uh, OpenBSD and stores it in the uh, var unbound etsy unbound.conf and we can get this configuration file. So it's listening on stuff and we want to try to grab all these files. So I'm just going to do read against these to see what we can get. Um, this is the DNS key. I don't know exactly what DNS key is. I did not expect that to work. We can look at the zones. So if we read zones, uh, we can't. Let's try reading this file. The server key doesn't exist. These three are what we need to um, interact with it. So we can get this server.pem. So what I'm gonna do is copy this and we can make dir unbound v uh, cd unbound v server.pem, paste that file. Then the next one we wanted, let's go back to the config. We want to get uh, control.key. That is a big file. So copy this. V control.key, paste. Then we want to grab the final one, which is control.pem. And we can just copy and paste this. V control, oh, caps lock was on. V control.pem, paste. And now we have the certificates. The next piece is configuring our um, client to actually use it. So already installed unbound, so I'm going to do sudo vi etsy unbound unbound.conf and we can configure it and this part is the video is not going to do it justice because this takes like hours of reading man pages to understand exactly how to configure this thing but uh, that doesn't translate well for videos so i'm going to say the control is enabled and to use the certificate and then we have to give it the file so server cert file and this is going to be home ipsec htb CrossFit2 unbound server.pem. And we'll copy this line twice because we need to edit it. So the next thing is the control key file. So control key file. And this was control.key. And then finally, we have the control cert file. And this is just control.pem. Okay, so now we should be able to issue unbound commands if we did this correctly. I think we have to do it with sudo. So we'll do sudo unbound control dash s for server 10 10 10 232 and then just status. And we can see it is running. So we can try to add a DNS entry. So unbound control dash s 10 10 10 232 
then forward add plus i, and we can say um, ipsec dash employees dot crossfit dot htb and point that to 10 10 14 8 on port 53. So it says it's okay. So the next thing I want to do is sudo nc lvmp 53 and we want to specify UDP because DNS is UDP. And we have to find where we can make someone click something. And something that's somewhat common in frameworks is the password reset obeys the host header. So what I'm going to do is go to, was it employees.crossfit.htb. We'll do this forgot password. And I don't know why, it was Jake Palmer or something, David Palmer, there we go. And we wanna intercept this request. And we can try to send him to me. So we'll do host ipsec-employees.crossfit.htb. And I'm going to issue this command again just before we do it. Send. And we get a connection back. Looks like some type of DNS. And let's see. Maybe I should have just done in my web browser. Let's go back to repeater. Or did I do it? it says only local host is allowed. So this is an error on DNS. It went here and well, it went to, I guess this got a response back and it was not local host. So it aired out. So what we have to do is stand up a DNS server and um, point it to localhost. So let's do opt fake DNS, I think. Do I have it? ls grep i DNS, fake DNS. If you don't have this, if you just go to GitHub, or let's just delete it and recreate it. So we'll do rm rf and then turn burp suite off. And let's do uh, GitHub fake DNS. Python, and we'll download this. So git clone, cd fake DNS, and all we have to do is create a configuration file. But what the goal is going to be is we're gonna do a DNS server, and then the first two people to resolve it, it's gonna to point to localhost, and then anyone after it, it's gonna to point to our machine. And the reason why we're doing that is this error message, whenever we did the password reset, uh, I don't know where it went, but it said must be localhost. And the thing this is kind of mimicking in the real world, because it may seem kind of weird, is um, like the email filtering systems. A lot of times when you send a link an email, some email filter is going to go follow that link and see if it's malicious. So this rebind attack is useful there because for a period of time or a number of requests, you can say, hey, this DNS is gonna go to this IP, it's gonna look totally legit. And then after it does the initial like checking of the links, that's when the DNS changes now to be the malicious IP address. So that's essentially what we're gonna be doing with this attack. The first thing we have to do is create a config file. So I'm just going to do fake.conf, and then we specify an A record, ipsec-employees.crossfit, dot htb and then we'll point it to 127.0.0.1 and then I think it's like 1 percent 10 10 14 8 so now if I stand this server up python 3 fake dns dash c fake dot conf dash dash rebind to enable this attack uh, run it with sudo ns lookup uh, server 10, 10, 14, 8, and then was it ipsec employees.crossfit.htb. It responds, uh, cannot find catfake.conf. It should have found it. Unmatched request. 
That's v fake.conf. I wonder if we need, let's just get rid of that. Unmatch request. I'm so confused by it matching the request and then unmatching it. Is that because of that rebind flag? Let's see. Server 127.001. It's definitely hitting this. When demos go wrong. Let's see. Percent or two percent. Let's just change it to ten, ten, fourteen, eight. Does this address change? Yeah, the address changes, and then it's trying to do some other lookup. I'm guessing, and that's where it fails. But we're getting the result back, so it does work. So let's try one twenty-seven zero zero one one percent. Rebind. So we do this. We got the address of 127.0.0.1. Do it again. And now it's 10.10.14.8. So this is the rebind attack. I'm not sure exactly what's going on with NS lookup, but that's good. So let's stand up a web server. Or we can just do uh, netcat. NC LVNP 80. There we go. Actually, I'm going to do 80 and 443. sudo nc lvmp 443. Because if the guy is clicking the link, I don't know if it's directing him to SSL or if non-SSL. Chances are it's non-SSL because the box wasn't listening on 443, but never know. So now we stood up our DNS server. Uh, we have to do unbound as well. So let's see. Unbound control. I don't know what pane I did that in. It's not there. Let's see. Unbound. This is it. So we add that DNS entry, stand up our server, and then we can go and forward that request. So David Palmer, Burp Suite, intercept, reset, forward it here. And we'll say ipsec employees.htb send. And it actually did two requests. So I think we got it. Let's try again. Let's put ipsec here. And let's restart, resend, send this, go back to a browser. And it still says only local host is allowed. So let's edit our config because maybe it does two different lookups. So let's say two because we're not seeing a third. So let's run this again and refresh this page. Go back to boot. ipsec-employees, send it. And it said reset link sent. Please check your email. So everything looks fine. We should make sure we're listening on port 80 again. And before I do that, I want to copy this. And I'm just going to wait a few minutes to see if any links get clicked and he goes to our server. So let's just wait to see what happens. It took a few minutes, but we do have a hit. He's hitting our server with this password reset and then this token. That Token seems larger than the other token I used out of the database. So let's try doing this. Maybe it's a combination of the database plus some type of secret. So what I'm going to do is kill Burt. And we're just going to send this and see what happens. And we say, we're sorry, but the password reset has been temporarily disabled. Um, so looks like we can't reset passwords. However, we can make him go to our page, so we may be able to use cross-site scripting to do other things, such as have him register an account. Because in the database, this user is listed as administrator. 
So since he's administrator, maybe we can make him do something fancy through cross-site scripting. The first thing we have to do is go back into a www directory and start building a cross-site scripting thing. And the things we're going to do, let's go test.txt real quick. Um, oh man, let me open up a new pane, cd dub dub, and we're gonna outline what we wanna do. So the first thing we're gonna do is grab a CSRF token from API auth. And then the second thing is we use that CSRF token to make a request to API sign up as I think David Palmer, was it? I think it was David, uh, whatever that account is. So we make that request and then we send the output back to us. Uh, we actually don't have to do this piece because once the account's created, um, we don't need anything. Like we could stop there, but uh, we're sending it back to us so we can see exactly what happens. Like if we get some type of error message, it would be good to know because we're taking a stab at the dark at how this account creation works. Um, let's see, let's do this. Can I put a few spaces? Oh, come on. How do I line this up good? There we go. So let's go into www. I'm going to do v password reset.php because that's the file he's already getting from us. So we can do HTML script and then we get end the script and HTML. And it should be worth noting that how I'm about to do this isn't the way most people recommend. A lot of people recommend when doing this type of cross-site scripting to use the on ready state change, I think. Uh, let's do XML ready state change, or not XML, XSS ready state change. Let's see, stock daily, is this gonna be good? One of these pairs probably should do it. Uh, that's a bit long. Okay, this is why I don't like. So. If we're doing it this way, um, it's saying when this is finished, then move on to the next. But looking at the code, it's a lot of jumping around. Like you're creating the XML request here. This is the very first one you create. Then on this changing, you do other stuff. It's just like a lot of jumping up and down. And how I do it, I like it being very linear. Like this is the code for the first one, the second, and then the third. So that's why I'm gonna be doing it this way, but if you're trying to actually do this on an actual engagement, you may want to use the ready state change because it may be compatible with more browsers or something. I'm not exactly sure why that's the JavaScript like way people do it, but that's how it's often done. This is how I do it. So XML HTTP request. So this is going to, um, whoops, stand up like our object that can create web request. I'm going to say, rec1.open, it's a git request to http crossfit club dot htb slash api slash auth. And then this other option right here, this is the um, magic. So by default, this third option is true, and that is the async. Um, let's do xml http request open. Uh, let's go to Google. Let's see, is this easy to see? Yeah, so you got the method, which we did get, then the URL, then async. And this async is gonna say it defaults to true. And essentially when it's true, it doesn't wait until this finishes. When it's false, it's gonna be blocking and wait for this script to finish or this line to finish before it moves on. Uh, since we're doing stuff with headers because of the cross-site scripting, we need with credentials is equal to true. And then we can send it. It did an indent because I forgot the semicolon there. So rec1.send. And then we can say ver object is equal to json.parse rec1.response. And let's see, JavaScript print line. I think it's console.println. Let's see. Print console.log we can do. So we can just do console.log object. And let's test this out real quick. 
Um, we don't actually need to do the phishing stuff to debug it. We can start with Python. So Python 3, HTTP dot server. Uh, we probably want to listen on port 80. And then I can just go localhost. And we want to specify password reset dot PHP. And it's going to download the file. And it's doing this because of the um, HTTP headers. So we could either change this by making a Python script and saying this isn't octet stream, this is just text, which wouldn't be too hard to do. Or we can just switch to a different web server. So I'm just going to try the PHP one. So sudo php dash capital S. And the thing I have to be careful about this web server is to make sure any PHP file I have doesn't have vulnerable code. Because if I have like a uh, PHP then system request thing in here and someone executes that script, they have code execution on my system because PHP is going to execute this stuff. But this little uh, shell doesn't have anything dangerous in it so I can use the PHP server to do it without too much worry. So zeros and then 80. So now let's refresh this page. We can go to the proxy, drop that one. We can intercept the response to this. And it is text HTML. So when I, oh, localhost slash password reset.php, it's probably still going to be what we think it is. So let's intercept the request. And it is, yep, text HTML. So a browser is not asking us to download the file, which is good. So we can forward this request. And then we can see my browser immediately is making a request to this API auth. And that should be good. Let's just go into a console to see what happens. Refresh. Turn intercept off. Uh, does it get to localhost? So we have to bypass something with cores right now. It says the same origin policy dis uh, allows reading the remote resource at this. So there's some type of protections in here. That's telling a browser, hey, don't allow them to access this. There is some uh, like niche uh, bypasses to cores and that revolves around the period so if we open up a new pane, we can kind of show this. So we do just a standard curl, dash S for silent, Q for quiet, dash V verbose, we want to see headers. We set our header, and this is what your browser is already going to do. So we're going to say origin is equal to HTTP 10, 10, 14, 8. And then we're going to make that request to CrossFit Club .htb slash API slash auth. And we can look at the headers, and we don't have any header that says access control allow origin. And that's what we're really looking for. So if the origin started from, uh, let's do crossfit-club.htb, we see this header. And this is what we want. So we can just grep for this. Um, maybe we say two and one. There we go. So if we get this back, we know this is on the allowed list. So we can try like um, the origin sending it to crossfit.htb. Does not work. How about like gym.crossfit.htb? We have an allow. And the trick here is in the actual cores policy, if they don't put backslashes around these periods, it treats them as wildcards. So if we do like gem x.crossfit.htb, it's still allowed. If we did like xy, it's not because a period doesn't match two characters. So this is where the cores bypass comes in, is we can register this domain using unbound gem xcrossfit.htb, and then because we have this, we pretty much bypass cores. So what I'm going to do is copy this, and for testing purposes, I'm going to add this to my host file. So now I can just, um, let's see, instead of localhost, we can specify 
this host and when I go here, I'm not getting any cores errors and it gives me the token. We can also, if we wanted to like debug the script, we can go into the debugger, go here, we can set a break on this. And then when we go to the console, we can say object and we have this, we could do object.token and we know that only outputs are token. So this is kind of how we can debug the JavaScript we're writing. So let's go back into our actual code. So V, um, what is it? Right, we gotta go in dub dub dub, v password reset dot php, and we can do the second and third request now. And I just realized doing it in this pane is a bad idea, so let's get rid of this. Go back to this window, and we're doing it in this pane because it has our notes on the left. So let's go back to vi. We can delete this, and we'll say the second request rec two is equal to. We'll just copy this actually. I don't know if that was quicker now or not, but it prevents a typo, which is always good. So we got that. We can say rec2.open. This is a post request to HTTP crossfitclub.htb slash API sign up. And again, we want to make this a non-blocking request. So we say false, and then we have to set the headers. So rec2.set request header. And we say content type, and we got to tell it it's JSON. So application slash JSON, like that. And then the other header we have to set is going to be the CSRF one. So X CSRF token, and we can just put this one equal to obj.token. So that should set the headers correctly in this. Since we're doing header stuff, let's do rec2 with credentials is equal to true. And then we have to um, create the data uh, payload we want to send. So const data is equal to json.stringify. And we do username, ipsec. And then do we still have it in repeater somewhere? I may have been able to just copy this. Yeah, I can just copy this. Like that. I think that's good. And the reason why we do that is because if we just do this, uh, maybe const data is equal, I don't know. It's gonna treat it as an object but we'd want this to be passed as a string. So that's what the json.stringify is doing. I think that is good. And I guess we can say rec2.send, and then we tell it to send the data. Semicolon, and then we do for request three is equal to new XML HTTP request. I probably should have just pulled it from the top, but oh well. rec3.open get HTTP 10, 10, 14, 8. And we say B2A to convert to base64, rec2.response. Close all that. rec3.send. And let's see where I screwed up because there's no way I did this correctly the first time. Or maybe there is. Let's see. Uh, we have to set the unbound and all that stuff. It's probably in one of these panes right here. So this is only DNS. Let's go back to this pane. Where's the unbound? This is what we want. Okay. I'm gonna do that in this window. So now I can just do up enter and up up enter. So sudo unbound control set here. And we wanna say Jim, what is it? Jim X CrossFit .htb. Jim X CrossFit .htb, 10, 10, 14, like that. Connection failed. Let's see, ping 10, 10, 10, 232. 
works. It may just take a second for Unbound to clear itself or something. There we go. I don't know what it is, but occasionally Unbound gave some weird errors. So we have that running. Where is the PHP server? Here it is. So first one rule. Oh, we have to go in burp and send it. So instead of saying ipsec employees, we can say gym x crossfit htb. Uh, access denied. Maybe my CSRF token or something's bad. Let's go back here. Now this is getting messy. Let's clear up a few panes. And I'm going to do it from scratch. So we have that first one rule. This netcat session we don't need. So I can clear that. Let's go in dub 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 php s 80 sudo. Let's stop the web server on this one. Okay, PHP web server is running. Unbound has been reset. Let's go to Firefox, Burp Suite. Make sure we're not intercepting something already. And David Palmer. And here is going to be Jim X CrossFit .htb. Send. Forbidden. Employees. X CrossFit .htb. Forbidden. So it works with employees, and we did, it worked with ipsec dash employees, but it doesn't work with like employees x. Huh. So there's something else we have to do. So if the regex is just really bad, we can put a slash here and try employees.crossfit.htb because the host header is terminated by slashes as well. It's just one of those unknown, unique things. So we can try this and see what happens. So Jim x crossfit.htb send. And it looks like it works. And if we go back here, we have unmatched request. So what we have to do here is now edit our fake.conf and put the new DNS, which is gymx.crossfit.htb. We rebind, send this, and we'll see if the user comes to us. If they make a request to this, it should work. The first two did. So now we're just waiting to see the um, user hit our web server. And this can take a few minutes. So we'll just wait and hope everything goes well. It looks like I screwed up somewhere because he got our page, but he never sent us a request saying like what the results of the account creation was. Both of them are just the token, which is him clicking the password reset link. I'm guessing he did it twice back to back because I may have sent the request twice. So let's go take a look at the password script. Looking at this, we are getting on this. This seems to, well, we don't know if this works actually, but we tested this with our local browser, so I assume this works. Uh, CrossFit Club. This is why I always use yank and put, so I should be using them. I think that was just a simple typo. So run this again. Uh, wait, we probably need to unbound control. Then run it. There we go. Match the request twice, so we probably wait um, another minute or two, or immediately. Wow. So it looks like we have a hit already. Does it get? And then we have this base64. If I did this in Python and did the Python web server, I could have it automatically decode that base64, which would be nice, but not too big of a deal. Uh, passwords do not match. 
So we screwed up somewhere. So let's see. Username ipsec. Password again with these typos. Let's just do P L E A S E S U B S scribe. And this is why it's super handy to do that third step, even though technically it's not needed. But for the sake of like error handling and things like that, oh man, that saves time. So do this and again, wait a couple minutes. Maybe it will be instant like it was last time, but highly doubt that. So gonna wait and see what happens. So it's been a few minutes and we have another hit. So let's check this out. It's not ending in, well, yeah, I thought the last one ended in equal. So we think this is different. Yep, there's two equals on the end of the last one. So at least it's a different message and it's user has registered successfully. So after we fixed up the two typos, this script worked and the password is please subscribe. So we can now go to this crossfitclub.htb slash login and log in with ipsec please sub I thought we could. Yeah, that's set. Sign in. What? Copy. B L E A S E subscribe. Something weird is going on. I may try a lowercase payload. The main reason being, let's see, do I still have it? No, it's sending me uppercase. I'm not sure with what went on here. Ipsec, P L E A S E, scribe. Okay, I just had to refresh the page. Um, I do not understand that one bit, but looks like it works. I wonder if that means like the password was somewhere cached in JavaScript or something. Um, interesting. <laughs> Let's just move on uh, and we can go to this chat thing. And looking around this, it looks like it's another like internal chat like the last one that was JavaScript. And I'm not sure what's supposed to go on here. Let's say hello and message each person to see if anything happens. We have someone mess, don't know what that is. Is it just random text? So doing hello on everyone. Is there anyone that responds? We could try also putting links in and doing attacks against them, but nothing seems too interesting. I'm just going to let this sit for a little bit and we'll see if we get anything. I guess we could be intercepting these requests to see what endpoint this uses. So if I go to proxy, we can look at history. And is anything happening? What if I do proxy intercept on? Do you know how Google Maps calculates traffic? What if I do WebSocket history? That's probably it. So let's turn intercept off. WebSocket history. Turn it to newest is first. And this is still the old WebSockets. I'm going to say no, and again, just trying to figure out how this application works. So we're sending a post to socket.io, and this global message, sender ID, content, and the room ID. So this room ID is probably going to be like individual people. So if I forward this, we're just getting WebSockets. So I'm going to try a WebSocket to an individual person. I guess, did I close it? Or did it redirect me? Don't know what happened. So intercept on, send this. We can see room ID 15, so this is probably his user ID or something. Private message, content hello. Again, nothing too interesting here. The thing I want to do is intercept a message. 
So I'm going to go turn intercept on again. I'm going to go to the options and it says does not match. I'm going to remove JavaScript. A lot of times when you test uh, like Node.js, Express, whatever, um, your burp window, you want to remove that extension from the bypass list. So now you can see we're just intercepting all these requests. So it looks like burp is working now. Um, I guess if it errors out or you take too long, it auto logs you out and redirects you. That would be my guess at what just happened there. So let's see. I'm going to wait to see if a user responds to me. Let's do hello. I should be able to see that message here somewhere. There we go. That's probably this one. So global message. Let's see. Just did a get. I don't have anything. I'm going to clear the history because I just noticed something somewhat interesting. So let's refresh this. Hello. Man, that is a lot of requests. So it's got this socket IO here. And when I join the room, it's going to send this user join message. So this is probably like the authentication. Whenever I join, it says this, which notifies everyone, hey, I'm here. And then we send message. And oddly enough, that person said, do you like rap music? And I did not get it, but it may be in a response tab. Maybe this one? Nope, that's just OK. So I'm not exactly sure how to correctly intercept this. Let's see if anyone else says anything. But this seems like we could do more cross-site scripting. Um, if we use a cross-site scripting to create a WebSocket and then tell people we join, we can probably just eavesdrop on the people chatting. So let's take admin because we know this is probably going to be David Porter, or not David Porter, um, David Palmer. And if we create the JavaScript around that, we should be able to see his messages. So let's do v password reset.php, HTML, and then script. We have to load the web socket or socket IO. So source equals HTTP CrossFit club dot HTB slash socket dot IO. And then let's see, is it just socket IO dot JS? Socket IO. Slash transport unknown socket dot IO dot JS. There we go. So this is the library it uses. And if you did not have this, if you just go to GitHub socket.io, this is a um, public thing. So we could probably use this as well and host it on our server, but might as well not host it on our server if they already host it. So socket.io.js slash script and then script so var socket is equal to io.connect http crossfit club dot htb and we don't need the slash ws here because i think it already does that or hold on yeah i think it should already do that we can do socket.emit user join, and then I'm going to specify ipsec so we can test this out. Uh, is it capital or lowercase when I'm doing it? Capital. Okay. Then socket on. And we have to figure out where the socket IO intercepts or gets messages. Probably just going to run Wireshark. sudo Wireshark 
let's do ton zero. And then refresh this. Hopefully someone says something in the chat soon. So I'm gonna pause the video until we get a message. We have a few messages now. So what I'm going to do is go back to Wireshark. I'm just gonna do Control F. And then we're going to search for a word, probably Quinn. And let's see, find string, send packet bytes, click find. And then all we do is follow the stream. And here's the function that was called, receive global. Now, if we wanna hook private messages, we have to figure out what this private function is. And probably the easiest way is to um, register another account on this server. So I'm going to kill Wireshark and then Let's just write this to TMP because um, we're not ready yet. And we can move password reset PHP back. And let's create the second account, ipsec2. There we go. And set up the PHP web server again. And then set this up. So hopefully we get a hit soon. So send this, match two. So what the goal here is to figure out exactly how we can hook the receive function for private messages and then create a cross-site scripting payload to take all the private messages and send them to us. So if we cat temp, we've started it. We tell everyone we joined, but we don't have the um, event where we can do if we get a message. So that's what we're waiting on doing. And hopefully by creating a second account, we'll be able to identify what that second message looks like or a private message. So I have an incognito open. Let's do ipsec2. Please subscribe. Oh, well, I just got to wait for him to hit my web server and then we can refresh the page. So I'm going to pause the video until this happens. So it looks like the second user got created and it doesn't end in two equals. And I think that meant that this was the user create thing. So let's just try logging in. I click sign in and that time it worked without refreshing. So it's probably just a myriad of typos earlier. I can't explain it any other way. So I'm logged in on one. And we can see ipsec2 is here. So I'm going to open up Wireshark again. Let's see. sudo Wireshark. Go to ton zero. And we're going to send a message. Please subscribe. So I sent that message to someone. <laughs> I don't know if I sent it from ipsec1 to 2 or vice versa. But... It doesn't matter. I'm just gonna search for the word please, and then we follow the stream. And let's see, that's not that one. Probably the next stream. Is please in here? If not, we're going to search and find the second one. So the issue here is I'm getting both. I have um, the send and the receive because I'm doing it on the same box. So let's see. TCP stream, that's not it. Let's just go back here, ASD QWE, send. And it's probably gonna be the second one because the first one is obviously gonna be sending. So we want the second match. Find. So this is send, we can see right here see and this is the receive so follow tcp stream private underscore receive is what we want to hook so i'm going to go back to my temp script and we can move password reset to the backup reset.php 
and socket on, we can say private receive. And on that event, we want to pretty much call like a function to send a message. So we can do uh, var then request is equal to new XML HTTP request and then rec.open. We do a git, then HTTP 10, 10, 14, 8, and B to A, json.stringify.message is the parameter we specified. And we actually don't need that true, I think. Get, because true is default. So that should be good. And then rec.send. And then we close this, think that closed, and then slash script, slash HTML. So we can test this out by seeing if we can hook ourselves. So I'm joining as IPSEC, so I should be able to go to this window. If I leave chat, let's Close out, close out. If I go here, IPSEC is no longer online. That is good. Let's go to HTTP, localhost, password reset. I did not go online, so I don't know if this worked. Um, looking at console, unexpected token, uh, line 967, so we have an extra parentheses there. So let's clean that out. Socket on. Okay. Let's run this. Looks good. Go here. Ipsec did turn green. And if I send a message, test, we get this base 64, which is probably just going to be test. So let's do echo dash n, base64 dash d, undefined. This is why we're testing it. So what do we have? Uh, well, let's see. Nope. I was going to say we're not sending anything, but we are. This stringify is like this. There we go. Refresh. Uh, this is the wrong one. Refresh this guy. Test. And if I go here, refresh. Test. I sent that in global chat earlier, I guess. This is looking like it's longer. Let's see what this message says. Echo dash n, base 64 dash d. Sender content is test. So we have a message. Uh, we could probably specify all the way down to just only say test, but this is good enough for me. So let's edit this. And the username is going to be admin, because we assume that is David Palmer. Going back here, capital A, looks good. So we're still hosting the server. We can resend the phishing request. So do unbound, set up fake DNS, go to responder, and send this. So that matched. We can close out Wireshark because we don't need this anymore. Let's see. We can close this window. Maybe. There we go. Come on. Stop. Exit. Quit without saving. So now we just got to wait for the user to hit our web server, which can take a few minutes. So going to pause the video. So it took a while, but we finally have him hitting our password reset page. And then we're sending some base64, so let's see what this message says. We're just going to check messages one by one. So echo-n, base64-d, 
And we get a shout out to, I guess, BSD Bandit. They're all yip yip. But let's just um, keep waiting until the next request comes in of someone messaging the admin. It's been a while and I haven't seen any new messages. So I'm going to test this out by messaging admin myself. So if I do test, I think we got it. There was a second message. So let's just see if this says test. If it does, we'll just keep on waiting to see if anything else comes through. So base64-d, and indeed it just says test. So let's just wait and see if we get any other messages. We got another message, looks to be a long one. Let's see what this one says. And really probably should create a Python app so it automatically decodes this base64 for me. But yeah, this one's just saying, wow, there's a town in Alaska where the mayor of the town is a cat. But again, let's just see the next message. So we have a few more messages. I just let it sit a while. If we go through these, let's try this one. Echo-n, base64-d. Are you a fan of Google or Microsoft? Let's see. A lot of people message this admin guy. Let's try this next one. Copy. Echo dash n, base 64 dash d. And here's an interesting one. Hello, David. I've added a user account for you with the password this. And our user is David, and we have a potential password. If we went into our inject, let's do python3 inject.py, and we read etsy passwd, we do have a David user. So. Um, let's try this again. So grab this and let's SSH David at 10.10.10.232. Try this password and we get in. We don't have like key, like up, down, whatever with the default shell. I think BSD normally uses CSH, but if we just type SH, we have our normal login shell that we're going to be used to. So it's time to look for a privask. We could just run linps, but this is OpenBSD. I'm not exactly sure how it would work. So I always like checking a few things. The first is just the home directory to see what type of bash history or MySQL history or Vim history we have. The answer is none of them. Bash history does exist, but it's pointed at DevNull. Actually, not bash history, just history. So nothing we can really get there. The other thing I like checking is like running processes. So I'm going to do like ps-aux and we don't get that much. I thought I was going to see a lot more. psef e. Actually, I'm not sure how to see processes. Um, maybe this is configured where we can't see processes of other users. You can do that on Linux by um, the hide PID flag. If you put that in Etsy F stab. So I'm going to try it over here, and I don't see hide PID or anything resembling that. Uh, grep-ri, hide PID. Let's point that to dev null for errors. So not sure exactly how this is working, but I don't think I can see processes of other users. Could be a different flag in PS to do that, but since top didn't work either, I'm going to say that hide PID thing is implemented. So the next thing I like doing is just looking at files owned by me. So I'm going to start, start by the um, groups, so sysadmin. So find slash dash ls dash group sysadmins. And, oh, find is a weird binary with these arguments. Um, this isn't working because I guess it's doing ls first and then going to do group don't understand the logic behind that. But if I change it, we have it now doing what I expected to show me all the files owned by the group sysadmin. And we can point that to dev null for errors and just let this run to find out if there's any files on the system that are owned by sysadmins. Um, is that a default group? Let's do cat etsy group grep sysadmin. No, it's like admins, right? Yeah. LSLA var log. ADM. So there's one file that is owned, or 
looks like a directory, opt sysadmin. So if I go into opt sysadmin, we have server, then we have statbot and statbot.js. So there's no syntax highlighting, so I don't know why it opened up in Vim. Let's just cat statbot.js and we can see what's going on. So we start off by loading WebSockets, file, system, log to file, create the WebSocket. And if we can connect, it says bot is down, fail to connect, fail to receive. Oh, there's an else here. So if we can't connect, it's going to either say fail to connect or fail to receive. And it's going to log message to tempchatbot.log. So that's good to know. And then it's just checking a message. So let's go look at tempchatbot.log. And we see August 12th modified time is 12.25. If I look at the date, that is this minute. So it's writing to this file. And I don't see anything here what's going to run constantly. So it's getting executed each time. And if I cat this file, we can just see it's saying bot is alive and then uh, Every 10 minutes, the bot goes down, so I'm guessing something restarts. But the script looks like it gets ran every single minute. Now, there is one other thing that's interesting, is there's no node modules directory here. It's just statbot.js here. I'm guessing node modules is somewhere in var. Uh, let's go cd slash var, find dot dash name, node underscore modules. Did I do that correctly? to dev null, Let's see node module. Let's see, let's just do find dot grep node underscore. Maybe we'll find slash. So it's in under user local. So user local lib node modules. Now if we Go over to Google and say um, Node.js load module. I think this is going to get me to the man page. Go here, not the video. Loading from Node modules folder. It has some really weird behavior. So it's going to check the parent directory, or check the directory. If it's not there, it moves to the parent directory and so on until the root of the file system is reached. So that means we may be able to create a node modules directory somewhere in this opt sysadmin folder because in the statbot folder, there is no node modules. So what I'm going to do is go to slash opt. I'm going to do find dot dash uh, type D for directory and then dash LS. And we can see all the permissions. We see this one. Well, these are all different. Well, this one's different because of the group, but this is 77, uh, I forget what this is, maybe 775, I think. It does not have write anyone. So members of the or owners and group can write here, but anyone can't. We're not member of wheel or root, so we can't write there. This one only root can write in the directory, but the sysadmin directory, um, members of root or I can click and highlight, sysadmins can write here. So if I go into sysadmins, whoops, we should be able to make directories. So temp, yeah, we can. So what we do here is we create a node modules and see if it executes and sends it over to us. So let's clear all this. I can just do a reverse shell here. Uh, let's do 9001. And then we'll make der dash p because we need to create two directories and this will create the parent directory if it doesn't exist. So sysadmin and then we're going to create node underscore modules and then we have to use one of the libraries it used. It loaded ws, fs and something logged a file or something. I'm just going to use the very first one which is ws for websocket. And then we have to create a um, file. So I'm going to go to the reverse shell cheat sheet. 
And I'm doing this because I can't use my trusted bash one-liner because that just doesn't work on BSD, this one. Um, we can use anything else probably. Well, not anything else, but uh, which one do I want? Where is it? This is the old faithful. So let's echo dash n. I want to make sure I can print this. And this line wrapping is going to get annoying. So I'm going to do it in a directory. There we go. So we do that rm, then nc. Let's make sure we have nc. We do. So we can say 10, 10, 14, dot 8, port 9001. And we also have to create this in um, a Node.js one line to execute code. So I can say require, I'm going to just do that. Then child underscore process, exec sync, then reverse shell one liner. And then like this, I think that's good. Let's cat this. Okay. I'm just going to put everything I want. So we can echo that to up sysadmin node underscore modules ws index.js is where it goes to load. So if I cat this rev shell, we have hopefully everything we need. Paste. Uh, directory doesn't exist anymore, so I guess there is a cleanup. So let's just make that directory again run it and we'll wait probably a minute so i'm going to look at the date and we have 20 seconds to wait so i'm just going to pause the video and just like that we have a shell if i do the who am i we have john so we are not root um i was about to type sudo dash l but this is in bsd um it's do as on bsd uh let's see who is john i wonder if we can still do the python trick for a tty python 3 dash c import pty pty dot spawn bin bash no such file or directory with script i wonder if i can do is it script dash q bin sh dash o dev null Let's try script dash c bin sh dev null. Script started, script done. Okay. Um, I'm not going to worry about getting a TTY. I'm sure it's possible, but not exactly sure how. So, the next thing we want to do is a groups again, and we can just repeat the process. Um, we're still in sysadmins, but we're also in the staff group. Group. So let's just see who, or what this group can do. So find slash dash group staff, and then dash ls error messages to dev null. And it looks like so far we have a binary user local bin log. So I'm going to see if anything else pops up. And if it doesn't, then chances are that's what we're going to use. I'm going to stand up a netcat, so LVNP 9001 again to uh, let's make the bin X for binary exploitation and then NC LVNP 9001. And we can cat this. Pipe it over to netcat 10, 10, 14, 8, 9001. Hopefully I did that correctly. I did, but I'm not directing this to a file. So we'll call this log. And we'll repaste this. And give it a few seconds because it's not going to 
terminate itself. But now we got this log binary. We can't execute it on Linux because all the syscall numbers are like incorrect. I forget the last video we did it on, but it was a nightmare doing that. So let's just execute it here to see what this does. User local bin lsla log. And this is set UID. That special bit is set. If we do stat on log, we can probably see. I don't know. But it looks like a set UID. So execute log and it wants a file to read. So log etsy pass wd and log file not found. If we pass it a log file like var log, let's do security.out dot slash log var log security dot out. Wait. Huh, it read a few things. Oh no, this is the security.out file. I just didn't know what it would be. I'd assume we'd have like the standard Linux timestamps, but no, it's definitely a weird file. Set UID deletions, cron tab. Yeah, but interesting. So we should look at this log thing. So let's open a new pane so we can open up Ghidra and take a look. My Ghidra is installed in opt Ghidra, so we can just run it. And then we'll open a new project by clicking that little dragon thing. And then once this opens, I hit I to open up a file to import. Go to the log, and we will import it. I'm just going to do all the default analyzation. So, come on. Yes. Analyze. Okay. And then we can go to the exports and go to main. And this is my issue with a lot of the BSD things. It just, how it does syscalls is really wonky. So this looks like it's going to be a syscall, this one function here. And if we go into it, it just does an infinite do while loop. However, if we look at it in the disassembly, let's see, it's moving this pointer to unveil to R11. If we go to a different syscall, we can kind of see that. Let's try maybe this. Awesome. You can see it does it for all of them, which is annoying. This one is fseek. So we could go through and relabel all of these, but for a basic reversing challenge, um, I've tended to like the cutter interface just a little bit more. So you can get that at cutter.re, I think. Yep. And then just download. We can take a look at what this looks like. There are some things I don't know how to do in this. So um, I like to find myself using both. So let's do chmod x downloads cutter dot app image. And then we can open it up select a file. So I've shown this before, whatever, oh, unbalanced and open keys, or probably open keys is the one I showed this on, the other BSD box. That's a pain. But we open the file, we can just do the default, analyze, and I have dark mode enabled. If you want to enable that, it's just edit preferences and then appearance, and then interface theme dark. So if we go to main, uh, we're in disassembly now. We can switch over to decompiler. So go to main. It looks a little bit different than Ghidra. I can switch over the decompiler mode this way and we can kind of see how it works. Um, we can see this function and it passes the arguments. And it's got the same bugs because it uses the same actual engine as Ghidra does, I believe. But if we go to this one, and we take a look at it in the decompiler view. Just clicking here, we can see this is putting puts in R11. Uh, let's go to this one. This is... Oh, yeah, I'm on the usage. So yeah, that is calling that. But this function right here above the ver, 
This is the unveil. So let's rename this. So 1FB0, we could probably just go in it. And then here, hit N. Uh, this is puts. I don't know why I keep going into that, but we just rename that. Uh, this is print F. So you could go through all these manually. And this is something that it should have done for you. But because it's BSD for some reason, it behaves differently. This is the one I wanted. This is unveil. So what was I going to show? Oh, the other thing that um, is different between these two views is the syscalls here don't have any arguments. If I switch that over to Ghidra's view, we can see it's putting arguments here. So 0x82c and 82a. If we go there, I don't know exactly. I guess maybe we can... We know that's pointed to slash var, but it's not telling us that. But if we switch to this decompiler, it is. So Gija's doing it better by knowing the function and it accepts two arguments. Um, Cutter is doing it better or Radar is doing it better by how it displays things. And then I also like the um, kind of Ada-like view of showing me the registers. So if I do a search on unveil GitHub, and of course we gotta go to Google to do that. Uh, not GitHub, BSD. We go to the syscall page and we can see it accepts two things, path and permissions. And if we go here, we have two registers being set. And the calling convention is the first argument's going to be RDI, then RSI, then RDX and RCX if you have arguments 3 and 4, and R8 and R9 for 5 and 6. So we can kind of just piece that together ourselves. I don't know exactly how to change, like, how it's defined to give multiple, but we know it's calling un uh, unveil on that. And then 82A is a permissions. I'm not exactly sure how it does it. But essentially, from my reading of this, and you can read it as well, I think this is pretty much equivalent to like a ch root type of thing. So it's setting me into this slash var directory. And then I guess if something fails, it says contact administrator. But if we go back to a reverse shell, uh, we're in var log, I think. Yep. So I can do dot slash log, and we can try to read um, like var dot dot slash etsy pass wd, and we get log file not found. So the unveil call is only exposing the slash var directory to us. That's why this path traversal attack won't work to my knowledge. Uh, BSD does have backups and stuff. If we do etsy change list, I think we can view it. And this is going to view all the files that are periodically backed up. And then when it's a plus, I think that means it's changed or something. But we can see there are SSH keys here. So we got SSH, ID, RSA. And those go into var backups, I believe. Yeah. So cat var backups. And then any slash be, uh, gets translated into an underscore. So it would be root dot SSH, ID underscore RSA. So that's kind of how it would look. So if I uh, do dot slash log on this file, not found. Let's see, did I do that wrong? Root. I wonder if the underscore behaves differently. Oh, wait, I see what I did. Um, I forgot the dot current because it takes multiple versions of backups. Remember we saw like that plus and things of things changing? Well, you got version history. So dot current, we'll do the latest one. So like that, we have now just stolen the private key of SSH. So we should be able to just log in. It's V, I, D, R, S, A, uh, wrong clipboard, chmod plus uh, uh, 600, I, D, R, S, A, SSH dash I, I, D, R, S, A, root at 10, 10, 10, 232. 
and we get password. We can add a dash V flag to see what's happening. And it says authenticated with partial success. If we don't have that, um, it's just going to fail. We don't have that partial success and ask for, well, oh, I don't have root. Uh, I think it, I deleted the wrong thing. That's what happens sometimes when you're talking, but we don't have any um, IDRSA file. It's just no more authentication to try and cuts us out. That's interesting, actually. If I did a user that doesn't exist, password login is enabled. If we try root, we can't do a password, but if we do a private key, it now asks us for a password. So it's requiring two forms of authentication. So let's take a look at the SSH config. So ls slash etsy SSH. Is there SSHD config? There is. So we can see match user root, authentication method, public key, password. And then if we cat etsy, I think login.conf, we can look at root. Where is root? Wow, this is a bigger file than I thought. Oh no, that's SSH config. Let's just do a bunch of line breaks. Cat etsy login.conf. See what this file looks like. Staff daemon default. So it's got YubiKey authentication. Here we go. So settings used by Etsy, RC, and root. And it's requiring YubiKey. So let's go back up to see that auth SSH YubiKey. So chances are this is going to be the password it is asking for. Um, in order to get the YubiKey stuff, we have to read files out of var. Um, Let's see, open BSD, YubiKey, varodb. Let's see, does it tell me where these files are stored? varodb, YubiKey. So how I would go about doing this, which doesn't translate to uh, videos well, is installing OpenBSD and YubiKey on your own system and then exploring how it works. Uh, vb root.key, root.uid, and root.ctr is probably what we want. So let's just see if we can grab those. So dot slash log, and then var db ub key, root.uid. So we got this. Let's just copy it. So make the ub key v root.uid and paste that. So the next one was, I think, root.ctr. And this is counter. So in terms of the counter, we just need to increment it by one because this is like the um, unique identifier for it. So if we did the same counter, the certificate it would go to would go to an old one. So we'd probably want to do like nine zero to make sure this counter is unique. Um, probably explain that horribly, but that is more of like the serial of a certificate, I guess. And you can't have duplicates of that. And I think key was the final one, which is like a AES key, I believe, in YubiKey terms. So v root dot key. Okay. And then I'm going to go to Google and let's try YubiKey simulator. Do we have one? GitHub. Is this going to work? I don't know if this is going to work. An index.php file to do it? <laughs> I'm going to try this. Uh, I haven't tried this before, but it's 10 years old, so who knows? But these things don't change too often, so maybe? the index.php, php-s, 
Uh, let's only listen on local host. Uh, let's do 8001. Local host, 8001. Token ID, encryption key, usage counter, lock code. I don't know what a lock code is. Let's see. Counter. Let's. Oh, God. Pasted in my terminal. So, counter, encryption key, and then, ooh, I don't know what these are, token ID and internal ID. I'm guessing token ID is root.uid. I don't know what internal ID would be. Let's go. Do I still have this? I wonder if I'd have to generate this. Let's just put zero. What happens? No idea. So let's try a different simulator. So yubikey. Simulator, GitHub. UB Sim, what is this? So it just wants us to run it with Java. Let's try this one. Git clone, UB Sim, Java C, UB Simulator. Oh, come on. Okay, we got a YK file. So it's got the public ID. I'm guessing this is the field that we didn't know. So AS key. Let's just edit this YK file. Uh, whoops. There we go. So UID. I'm going to say this is secret ID. The counter. Let's do 985090. And then secret AES key. That is going to be this. And what if we run this file again? Still errors out. And I am not sure why. We may just have to be going to something else. Let's see. Java XML bind does not exist. So I may have to install a package. Let's see. Trying to do this. Removed. Is this going to tell me how to install it? Reproduce. So I think it wants just a old version of Java, like Java 8. Uh, Java version. We're on 11. Uh, app search open JDK. Do we even have eight? We do. sudo apt install open jdk eight jre. So the installed. So how do I set my Java version? Locate Java. Probably want to do dash r for regex grep for 8, let's see, slash user local java, no, user java, where are you installed java, grep 8 and bin, here we go, maybe we can try this, 
Does Java C exist? Let's see. Jerry bin Java. Let's just try Java and then where is the file called? Where is it? UV simulator. Let's try setting the version. So Java Linux set version, I think. Let's see. Switching between Java versions on Ubuntu. Maybe it's the same. Update alternatives config Java. Let's try this. And then if this doesn't work, I'm probably just going to switch and um, use a different program. So Java C, UB Simulator, and still has that error. So switching it up, we're going to use the YubiKey provided binaries. Um, they are really under documented, which makes it hard to use. But thankfully, OXDF had did that research for us and helped me a lot with this part. So I'm going to search for uh, Yubico's GitHub repo. And then we just need the, I think it's Yubico-C for the repository. And we want to download this. So git clone, download, and then one of the um, dependencies is going to be ASCII doc. So sudo apt install ASCII doc. And then we will do an auto reconfigure to install it and just manually compile it. So I'm going to just pause the video until this install finishes. So we're not waiting for it to download. Now that ASCII doc is installed, we can do auto reconfig install. And then once this is done, we can do dot slash configure and then uh, make install. So let's do dot slash configure and then make install probably needs to be sudo so I can place it in the places it needs to go. And we can try yk generate dash h and oh, we don't have something. That's not good. Um, sudo make check past everything, sudo make install. I wonder if I have to run yk generate as root. Uh, let's open a new pane, yk generate. Where is this file? Does it exist? sudo update db. And then once this finishes, we can just do a locate for that file. But that's weird. I can also Locate. I'm not having any luck with this YubiKey piece of the video. Let's see. Dot libs. The file exists. I wonder if I go into dot libs. YK generate. Is it going to pull it? Cannot find file or object. That is bizarre. Let's try a different YubiKey thing. Let's do UK YK purse, and we still have that. Let's just now search the error message. And let's see. I wonder if I can just get rid of that. Let's see what this says. Update. LD library path should be use a local lib. It's not. I wonder uh, what happened to my box. But we can set this and then try it. So export LD library path is equal to this. Okay. Well, we got it working again. I'm uh, not sure what happened, but we should be fine. So let's go into yk generate dash h and we need to give it these parameters. So it wants everything as hex, I believe. So the first thing is the AES key. 
Then it wants the internal name, which is this one. And then it wants the counter, and it's 16-bit, so it wants hex. So if I go to Cyber Chef GitHub, let's see, we can just convert this to um, hex easily. Could probably do it in Python or something. I've just gotten the habit to go to hex. So delimiter none. Is that right? I think that just took one, two, three, four. That doesn't look right. Two hex. There we go. I think it was taking that as a ASCII value, so I'd probably have to do like two decimal or something, and then two hex. But Google saves us. So we want to increment this by one. And then let's see, it wants low and high. I don't know exactly what these are. Um, it wants them in 8-bit form, so I'm just going to try 0, 0, 1. Uh, YK counter must be four characters. So maybe 0, 8, 0, 2. YK low must be four characters. YK high must be two. YK use must be two. And we got a key. Uh, we can try if this works. I don't know what the low and high are. Um, doesn't seem to change anything. But sh-i idrsa root at 10.10.10.232. And it wants the password, we can try this. And failure. So we did something wrong. Let's try changing up the X to 0F08. Um, the reason why I did that is just we chopped off the F earlier. So I'm putting the F back on to leave it at 8 form. And we can try logging in with this key. So copy paste and it does not work Let's see do we generate the key afterwards I don't think that would matter but guessing we have something wrong let's try the YK parse to parse a key and this one requires the AS key and then the token so let's do cat UB key root dot key so we can parse this and then this and let's see the counter let's make sure a counter is correct 3848 and if I cat UB key root dot counter That may be wrong. I wonder if root.ctr was the wrong one to use. I honestly not sure how this works. I do want to try one last thing real quick, or hopefully one last thing. Let's try generating with this. Um, I'm guessing somewhere along the lines my counter is wrong because it's the only thing that really makes sense at this point. So let's go SSH again. There we go. So it looks like that session has to be two. And then we can cat root.txt. So probably need to do more research at exactly what this is. But let's see if it works twice. Failure. So let's try incrementing that counter by one now. So 0f09 and grabbing it and there we go so we'll always have to increment the counter when we do a successful auth but that's it
Hope you guys enjoyed the box. Take care, and I will see you all next week.